Today's video is brought to you by storyboardthat.com. Please visit teachercast.net slash storyboardthat for a limited time offer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast podcast, episode number 123. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Today, we're going to be talking to two people from the Ed Surge family to talk all about their great website and how you can learn from it. There's, of course, several great ways to reach out and be a part of our show each and every week. There's, of course, on Twitter, at TeacherCast. Leave us a voicemail over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at TeacherCast.net. And, of course, you can subscribe to our audio and video shows over at TeacherCast.net slash iTunes and TeacherCast.net slash YouTube. And, of course, it is that time of year. It is back-to-school season. And, of course, as teachers are getting back into the classroom, they're trying to figure out where can they find all those great resources for their classroom. And over the summer time i had a chance to talk to mary joe and michael from ed surge at the isti conference and we had such a great time i invited them on the show today to talk all about ed surge and to share what you can do to be successful this coming school year mary joe and michael welcome to the show thank you so much for joining me today thank you jeff. hey jeff thanks for having us really happy to be here again we really enjoyed talking to you at ISTI. it was a lot of fun ago. it was a great show i mean i'm so happy that isti came off well Twenty-five thousand educators all in philadelphia i didn't have to drive really at all <laughs> it was very convenient for you that's for sure it was an amazing amazing time and you know the neat part about that is there was a lot of learning there was a lot of networking but most importantly, there were a lot of cheesesteaks. Did you guys happen to get any? I did not, but I know I, Mary Jo got one right as she snuck out of town, I think. I got one right before I got on a flight, and what I learned is you should never eat a cheesesteak right before you get on a flight. That's a really <laughs> horrible idea. It was it was delicious, but my um, my stomach didn't quite agree with me as a result. But, but that you know, being we're, said... We're, we live in the Bay Area. We're not used to cheesesteaks. No. So maybe if you live in Philadelphia, you can have a cheesesteak whenever you want. Yeah. So what you're saying, Mary, is that you need to come back to Philly to try another one. I need to come back to Philly to try another one and then stay there for three days <laughs> as opposed to hopping on a flight right after it. But, yes, I, I, I'm all for trying the local food and fanfare whenever we go to conferences around the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to us going to New Orleans in early September, which is going to be quite interesting. A lot of good food and in Ed New Surge Orleans. Summit. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Now, talk to us a little bit about that because Ed Surge has – summits all across the country recently you had one in dc you had one in boston i know you're going to be having one in mountain view talk to us a little bit about these ed surge summits and what can we expect if we're participants yeah so um like you said jeff we're doing uh we're going to do 11 summits this year by the end of the year we've, we've done six we've got five more uh new orleans is next we're going to do our first summit out of the u.s uh, in toronto at the beginning of october um summits kind of expand on the the general mission of ed surge which is uh, to help inform everyone in, in the, the education technology space, um, giving information uh, to teachers, to companies, to administrators, to investors. Uh, and we really feel that when you kind of put everybody in the same place, make them talk to each other and, and help everybody understand what everyone else is thinking, then everyone can make better ed tech decisions, and that leads to better educational outcomes uh, around the, the country and, and the world. Yep. Uh, for summits specifically, uh, those are really great days where you get a chance uh, as an educator to interact with uh, with companies in a, a sort of a non, non-traditional vendor hall uh, experience. Non, you don't, you're not pressured to, to make it a, a, a purchase. You're not, uh, companies aren't handing out tchotchkes, you know, no pens, freebies, or stickers, exactly. Um, so just a conversation between an educator and a company uh, where an educator can say, hey, this is the, the instructional problem that I'm facing in my school or my district. Uh, and a company can say, oh, okay, great. Like, this is how we might be able to help you or this is how we can't help you or we'd like to get some feedback on what it is we're doing. Um, it's, a, it's two days full of, of great conversations, really high energy. And uh, I find usually I can't, I can't really talk when I'm done. <laughs> A lot of movement, a lot of talking. Stand. You can barely stand. Yeah, I need talk. to sleep for about three days. Yeah. Uh, so they're really, really fun days. 
So let's just, I, I think we kind of jumped a little bit into the conversation here. Let's just back yeah. up. Of course, uh, we're talking about Ed Surge, edsurge.com. Uh, give us a little bit of the history. When did Ed Surge start and, and, and what has been the lineage here with the website? So Ed Surge started in 2011. Um, the founding team was composed of Betsy Corcoran, our current CEO. She was a journalist for Forbes and the Washington Post and really focused a lot on technology out here in the Bay. Um, but when she had kids and started working for her kids' school, she sort of saw this odd disparity between the people that were creating educational technology for the schools and the people that were using it. There was no conversation happening between them. And as a result, there was sort of a loss in uh, good practices because the companies didn't always know what the users wanted and the users didn't always feel like the companies really cared what they wanted. And so um, she started Ed Surge with a team of three, including a teacher, um, an engineer, and a designer. And the four of them launched Ed Surge with just a baseline newsletter, which they sent out, I think, to like 25 people the first round, um, talking about Ed Tech and what was going on in the Silicon Valley and what teachers were using, um, who was getting funding. And fast forward to now, we've been around for about four and a half years, and Ed Surge has grown at an ungodly speed. I mean, we, we, and I'm not, I'm not saying that pure, purely just because of the fact that I work for Ed Surge. I used to read Ed Surge before I came on the team. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, wow, so this is a free source of information and it's creating a conversation that I didn't know um, was out there. And now I can sort of jump into it and get involved. Um, but we do a lot. I, you know, Michael talked about summits. We do summits, we do news, yeah. we have reports on products and trends in the market. Um, we do meetups. We just had our second annual Ed Surge Ed Tech Ed Camp last night. We loved it. So much fun. So much fun. Um, but we do a lot of other things too. We recently just launched um, a concierge program, which basically is where we talk to district administrators and say, what are your needs? What do you need help with? Can we help you find the tools that are going to solve your need? And sort of connect the tools and the administrators to hopefully fix whatever their problems are that they have. So. Jobs board, lots of lots of other stuff. Yes. Bringing, bringing together the different parts of the the ed tech industry and hoping everyone can can learn from each other and improve. Mm -hmm. And I was just gonna say, your the Ed Surge Jobs Board is absolutely amazing. I know when I was recently looking for a new position, everyone said, "Hey, go check out that Ed Surge thing." And there's yeah, a lot of positions yeah. that are open on there. It is awesome. definitely worth the time to go check that out. Talk to yeah. us a little bit about the growth. How many people are in the Ed Surge family right now? Yeah. Well, funny you should ask. Yeah. <laughs> so we we have. I'm not actually sure. Is it 18 or 19 people full time? Full time, I think it's 19. Okay. And then we have a couple of part time people, a couple of contract yeah. people. Yeah. Um, so a lot. Uh, we've definitely grown uh, since since 2011 when when Betsy and Nick and Augustine and mm -hmm. and Matt started it. Um, so yeah, 19 of us now, uh, and we're actually looking to hire like eight to 10 new people in the 10. next next couple of of months. Yeah. Um, so it's a really fun, exciting time to, to be here. And it's not just, we're looking to hire people on all of all of our teams, you know, growth people, pe we're looking to hire a reporter, a community manager, summits, everything is kind of expanding right now. Um, and, and we're looking to bring in people with all sorts of backgrounds, education backgrounds, writing backgrounds, business backgrounds. And I think that's this part of the success of our company is that everybody on our team has a very different story. But at the end of the day, we all have, we all share kind of the same passion or establishing these dialogues between the creators of the products and the people who use the products. Is it's there an, oh, is there an age limit to the, the type of staff member that you're looking for? I mean, let's say that there are, I don't know, three humans in the world that are really unemployed right now. They can't talk yet, but, <laughs> but let's just say that there's a, there's a father that wants to get them a job and make them a little bit more productive in the ed world. They're good with podcasts. They're great on videos. <laughs> Well, considering we just met two of them right before this conversation, yeah. if the I, third we'll, proves the same. We'll hire anybody in a Darth Vader shirt. Yeah. That's, our, that's our policy. Do they have to yeah. know how to walk? Yeah, yeah that, that helps. That does help. That's right. That's right. <laughs> correct. Correct. But if they have energy, that's what we're looking for. So there you go. So talk to us a little bit about creating these things. I mean, I, I'm a subscriber to the Ed Surge um, RSS feed. You're, you're, the shows out there are phenomenal. One of the, the, the articles I just happened to – going through my feed i'm looking at that going you guys got an interview with mark cuban that's yeah. that's yeah. really cool how did that one work out 
<laughs> stalking. Um, no, seriously. But actually. But actually kind of stalking. I mean, you know, that's a great question, Jeff, because I think it, it's always a surprise even to us when we get interviews with these people that are really high tier, busy, uh, incredibly, you know, traveling all over the place. With people like Mark Cuban, if you ask the right questions, usually they're pretty game to answer. Um, especially if it's something that they've invested in or they've created or they feel extremely, extremely passionate about. Um, we've interviewed Mark Cuban a couple of times, and I think what people respect about the EdSearch brand is that we're not just we're not just delivering information to entrepreneurs, and we're not just delivering information to educators, and we're not just delivering to investors. We sort of try to cover the gamut. So anything that we write about, we try to think about who that audience is, and then when we convey that to the people that we're looking to interview, it seems to make them feel more comfortable and 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 more trusting of the fact that we can reach audiences that potentially other journalistic organizations might not necessarily target. I mean, what do you think, Michael? Yeah, I think I think that's right on. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. This is why Michael and I work well together. Yeah. Mary Jo's usually right. Yes. I I love the brother sister dynamic here. This is really really cool yeah. to watch. Nice. Great. <laughs> The second awesome. time I got that on camera, that was good. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> good. Great, great. <laughs> so, you know, one of the shows that we do here on TeacherCast is called Educational Podcasting Today. It's where we take a look at educators who are creating media, and we talk about how they're doing it, how they're putting it together, and then we talk a little bit about the nerdy behind-the-scenes stuff. Talk to us a little bit about the new Ed Surge podcast. Yeah, so <clears throat> the podcast has been around since. Like, February or, or March. It just started them, yeah. just started this year in, in 2015. Um, you know, it's something that I, Mary Jo and I have both been podcast fans for a long time, and um, you know, it was something where we, we finally felt like, all right, I think it's it's time to experiment with this. You know, mm -hmm. we've, we've been doing the newsletter for a number of years, like Mary Jo said. Um, let's let's try to to do something new. Maybe there are people out there who, for whatever reason, don't want to read a newsletter or they don't have the time. Maybe they've got a 120 mile commute one way and they need something to listen to in the car. Um, and you know, that's an audience that, that we felt it was time to try to tap into. And yeah. so um, it's been a really fun uh, experiment to to dive into podcasts and, and try to reproduce um, some of the people that we like listening to. I listen to like This American Life every every week. Jeff, I listen to, to your show a lot. <laughs> um, I listen to you know the, the new Gimlet uh, podcasts that are out. And it's really cool to, um, to, to, to kind of see what those people are doing and, and try your best to imitate it. We're not anywhere close yet but i think we have been making uh slow and steady progress every week right we're not doing anything new we're just learning from people like you and you know listening to this american life and the ted radio hour and just learning as much as we can and also completely throwing ourselves on the altar of dignity and telling our listeners that they can give us as much feedback as they possibly can and honestly most of the changes that we've enacted i think have come pretty directly from people who yeah. either listen to our podcasts or have experience podcasting and that seems to have worked for us pretty well because in both of those cases you know if they're listening or, or they're doing it they both parties have experience that we don't yeah. i mean we're still very much even though ed surge has had steady growth we're still very much a startup yeah i mean you we i know we've talked about this with you jeff but our podcast recording studio is still a giant cardboard box covered in insulation <laughs> material but it works and at the end of the day the, when the content is good the listening is going to be good i'm so and glad you said that i mean yeah. i i i we we do a lot of podcast consulting here and everyone talks about you know when should i go out and find advertisers and when should i go and upgrade my microphone and i'm sitting here going you've recorded like two episodes just just right make right. good content and yeah. I'm, I'm also big on saying you know i've recorded almost 600 shows the first 599 not that great keep, <laughs> keep going and keep making good content here what what advice have you been given or what advice would you give somebody who wants to start their own show i i think so so two two things that i've learned in the in the last eight or nine months uh, as we've done this is um, the, the first is I was really surprised at actually how cheap it was to, to start recording the podcast. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we the first episodes that we did were just on Mary Jo's computer, you know, using the mic in mm -hmm. in the Mac. Was it the best sound ever? No. Um, did, you know, was it was it were we able to put that out uh, and, and have people listen to it? Yeah, it was it was fine. Um, so that was that was a big surprise to me. Um, the other the other thing is, I think at a certain point we realized, hey, we just 
we what's really interesting when, when we started the podcast we tried to make it a little bit more of a, of a discussion format and that that worked all right um but what we found our listeners really thought was interesting was when we were talking to other people. Right. Um, and so we found that our, our listenership really started growing and we were having, honestly, a lot more fun. Yes. Um, when we started going out and, and trying to get other people on the podcast. So, um, you know, Jeff, we, we've talked to you for the podcast. That show will be going up soon. Um, we've talked to Linda Weinman of lynda.com. Mm -hmm. We've talked to Matt uh, Candler. Matt right. No and you have superintendents from, from different parts of the country. Um, once we sort of, uh, once we, made the effort to start inviting those people and, and collaborate with them to, to develop shows. I mm -hmm. think our listeners really enjoyed it. And and for the most part, you know, if you ask somebody to be on your show, they're pretty excited about yeah. it. Like, we haven't, I, we're honestly, excited to be on this show. Yeah, right exactly. Now. Yeah. We were yeah. thrilled to get this invitation. And uh, I'm not sure anybody really has turned us down for reasons other than scheduling. Um, people let, you know, they like to share their experiences. They like to like to be interviewed. And um, it's been it's been relatively easy to to bring people onto the show and and our listeners seem to really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. It's an in, it's an interesting dynamic when you go from a being a teacher role to being an educational podcaster because when you're a teacher you you just by nature you are the one that's standing up and preaching but when you're an educational podcaster it's not about you and right. and you know my philosophy on all of this I kind of take the Larry King approach. You know, they're not there to listen to Larry. They're there to listen to Tom Cruise or they're there mm -hmm. to listen to Gina Davis or whoever else. And, you know, there might be a couple times where you don't want to tune into the Larry King show because you don't like the guest. You don't like the topic. But tomorrow I've got the president on and I'm going to watch that one. And right. it's Do you just have the president on tomorrow. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to give away anything <laughs> on here. Um, but but tomorrow. but I, I, I you, you just made I, I did want to bring something up, Michael, what you said a little earlier. You made a rookie podcasting mistake and yeah. I, I want to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You <laughs> now I know that when this show is over, um, the Ed Surge team is going to want to listen to it. Right. And you just got done saying you don't have to spend a lot of money on podcasting at all. No, 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 no. Mike, camera's on you right now. You want to make sure that the entire Ed Surge team knows it's going to cost a lot of money and you need to buy yeah. a lot of equipment. And Mary you need Joe to and buy. I are going to need probably 50 to 60% raises if we're going to continue to do the podcast. Oh, minimum. Right. Yeah. And in order to go out and interview Mark Cuban, you have to get that Ed Surge jet. And yes. you, yeah. so. And me, you know, first class all the way every time. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so we can go back and we can edit that out if you want, Mike. But, <laughs> you know, just, just making sure that we're okay with all that stuff. There is. I will say. I will add, though. I, I know we're we're talking in jest, but you know, it, it is funny how, yes, you can start pretty much podcasting for free, but a couple of well placed purchases can actually make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the idea that, you know, spending a hundred dollars on a Blue Yeti microphone actually did improve our sound it quality did. quite a bit. Yeah, and even spending a little bit of money on incubation material. Why do I keep saying incubation? I insulation. I keep saying incubation because we're writing a school incubators piece right now at EdSearch. But um, incubation material, I keep saying it, insulation <laughs> material, it just, it makes the sound quality so much better. Mm -hmm. And some of our more frequent listeners, the ones who tune in every single week religiously and who offer us feedback consistently, they actually do pick up on those little things and do let us know. And that, I think, at the end of the day is what's most important to us, is having having the loyal listeners that really do care about the content, but they also do know what's going to make it easier for them to absorb the content. Because it, it's, it's really about their consumption, you know, what they're consuming and how they consume it. That's what we have to listen to on a regular basis. Absolutely. And you can find so much out. I mean, I, we're, we're talking about this now on, on the, the educational podcasting show, but not just looking at your stats. It's one thing to say I've got 10 downloads or a million downloads. I don't care about that number. I care about length of time listening. And, you know, YouTube looks at that and, and, you know, YouTube will tell you exactly per video how much time people are watching your video. And, you know, I got videos that have tens of thousands of hits and stuff like that. But if, if everybody's only watching for two minutes, so what? Yeah, you know, it, that's it's, actually it, that point is interesting because we when we get user feedback from people. I actually don't see as many people asking for video media. I see more people asking for, for podcasts, for sound media. Maybe that's because you only have to consume it in one mm -mm. capacity. You know, you're nope. only, you only have the auditory element, not the visual in the auditory. So you don't have to physically sit down. You can, you know, listen to it while you're doing something else. You can multitask because uh, it's one mode of transfer. I'll give you my, but, uh, I'll give you my yeah. answer for that one. 
everybody has one thing in common. We all go to work. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 you know, look, I, we, can, we can talk about audio downloads versus video downloads. And, and, and you know, my, you know we, we're doing a video show now. And, and, and my goal when I do a video show with people and we do demonstrations is my goal is to get you to go back to your computer and, and watch it. Um, because I know you're listening to it in the car for the first time because maybe you, you, know, you go to your podcasting player and everything just downloads. And you know, I've got six or seven feeds on here uh, I'm on iTunes. And, and no matter where you are, I want you to go back to iTunes and watch the video feed. I want you to actually consume my content twice. But everybody, you know, everybody drives to work or gets to work somehow. And, and that's why the audio is so much more important to go. But, but you know, good video numbers are there too. Yeah, mm-hmm. true. I would agree. And and I like the way the, the way that you just put that. And you know, this is basically the thesis statement for the podcasting show. Can you podcast for free? Yeah, <laughs> you can. You know, yes. you you can take your phone and you can talk into it, and that's a podcast, right? Right. Um, eighty bucks, ninety bucks, whatever it is. You you know, you get yourself a Yeti. This microphone here, I think these are like forty bucks, something in yeah. that respect. These are yeah. wonderful. Um. You can do all of this stuff for a couple dozen pennies, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually, I just had a teacher who, Scott Hasselwood, he wrote for us for the 50 States Project. He's in Oklahoma. He recently started podcasting on his drive to work. Mm-hmm. And so every morning he drives to work, he records himself talking about some element of education, whether it's ed camps or social media. Um, and he posts them online. And even if it's not necessarily him interviewing other people, him getting out his thoughts about some of these experiences and tools that he uses, he told me actually is very self-informative. It makes him realize certain things about it. So I, I would say the same. I mean, I feel like we learn a lot from the podcasting Absolutely. ourselves. Yeah. And it probably informs some of the work that we actually end up doing at EdSearch afterwards, like further stories that we write more people that we want to interview, Mm -hmm. things that we should start bringing up more frequently, that our interviewees start bringing up more frequently. Um, Yeah. It's a learning experience for everybody, including us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And have you started to incorporate your podcast into your editorial calendar? I mean, are we now doing the written work with Mark Cuban, and then we're going to do the video interview with Mark Cuban, and then we're going to do the, you know, live summit at Maverick's headquarters? I mean, I... I, (laughs) How, because Ed Surge is so huge, how have you decided to kind of merge all those technologies together? Yeah, it's something that's very much still, I think, a work in progress. Mm-hmm. Um, the podcast, we, you know, it's been going, like I said, since the beginning of the year, but it's still a little bit of an experiment. Um, we want to see, still trying to tweak about what is what is best, what is not best mm-hmm. for, for our listeners and what sorts of content they, they most enjoy. Um, I think the word one thing we're always trying to do at EdSearch is we have a lot of different things happening and uh, there are always yeah. better ways we can integrate those things. And, yeah. and certainly I think the written editorial the podcast is one place we could probably be a little bit more it's thoughtful. A link. Yeah, yeah. There, there's, there is for sure a link there and we could probably be a little bit more thoughtful about uh, combining those two things and, and making sure they're supporting each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, for now we're excited to, if, if Mark Cuban's available in writing, we'll take him in writing. And if Jeff Bradbury is available via podcast, we'll take him in podcast and and kind of go from there. One of the things we actually just experimented with was we had our big Davis summit Mm -hmm. in Davis, California. It was our first superintendent specific event. And uh, we had a bunch of panels and we recorded the panels and put them up in podcast form. And I I don't know about you, Michael. I was a little nervous about that just because panels are really long and I, w- I wasn't sure about how the audio quality was going to turn out. And for some of the panels, the audio quality is a little, yeah. you know, subpar. Yeah. But the numbers on those have actually been really great. And I think part of the reason is because how frequently do you get the chance to listen to a superintendent, you know, a director of ed tech, and then two company representatives debate project-based learning right. or data integration or learning analytics all within one 45 minute long conversation with a moderator. Um, and I know this is something South by Southwest EDU puts all their panels up line, um, online in podcast form. And that seems to actually be a pretty popular thing nowadays. So that's one thing that we're experimenting with. But Michael's right. The, the link between editorial and podcasting is definitely something that we probably could and should do more, even if we just have a direct transcript into written form in case people would rather read than listen. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but yeah, every day is a learning experience. Just every like day. You said. Yeah. <laughs> And, <laughs> and the neat part about what you're saying there is you really do have your ear towards your audience. Um, how does your audience get a hold of you? If, if somebody has an idea for a story or wants to write or wants to, how do people get a hold of you at EdSurge? Well, email is, you. there's this thing called an email that's really popular. Apparently. <laughs> have you heard of this? Thing? No, I haven't. No, okay. um, so I'm Mary Jo at EdSurge.com and Michael at EdSurge.com. Mm -hmm. We anybody who is interested in writing for us should feel absolutely free to send us an email. Please. Um, and you know, in terms of attending our events, we have lots of events that we would be happy to invite people to. Um, we also have the Ed Search Twitter at Ed Search. Yeah. Um, what else do we have? Oh, we have a search on Twitter, yeah, at MJ Matta or at MJ Wintz. Um, so we are we're pretty responsive, I think, via email or, or Twitter. Um, yeah, like like you said, like anybody, if you've got an idea for a story or you have a story you've written and you need a place to publish it, we'd love to hear ideas from, from educators, from entrepreneurs, from administrators, from whoever. We'd yep. love, love to hear what you have to say. Everybody. And we welcome them at any time of day during the week. Um, sometimes <laughs> we're working pretty crazy hours, but uh, you, w you should hear back from us pretty soon, pretty quick. Guys, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time. Before I let you go, I want to put you on the spot. Now, I started something on my educational podcasting show, and I was thinking, well, you guys are educational podcasters. Would you guys mind the teacher cast five questions? Ooh. No, I think bring it on. I I'm think. always game for yeah. it. I'm going to let you do most of them. Ooh. All right. Okay. Just so you know, by the way, members of our team are coming into this room and trying to distract us from this podcast, and we've kept pretty straight faces. I lost it a little bit earlier. The but, CEO yeah. of Ed Surge is doing it now, Betsy Corker, and so it's a little, it is a little distracting, <laughs> just a tad. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, let's, 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 let's get it. Here we go. All right. Yep. Um, Question number one, what is your, and you can't use Ed Surge for any of these answers. What is your favorite Twitter account to follow or hashtag to follow? Ooh. I guess we'll both answer. Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to go first? Do you, sure. Oh, man. My favorite hashtag to follow is EdTechChat. There's just so much that comes up on it. It takes a long time to look through, but there's a lot of great stuff that comes up on it. Uh, my favorite Twitter account to follow, this is, this is just puts me out as a, as a huge bougie nerd, I think, is but I love the Economist Twitter account. Um, they have such a wide variety of things you can learn uh, from their account. They tweet like thousands of times a day, and they have so, for everything from education to politics to business from all around the world. It's a wonderful place to learn new things. Nice. Uh, number two, what is your favorite educational tool? Oh, God. <laughs> Jeez, these are these are tough questions. And, and you can't. And I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you one that one one person I asked this to almost broke the bank. But you can't say the internet. Yeah, <laughs> ah, that's good. <laughs> you cannot say the internet. Oh, man. So my so I mean my favorite tool for my personal education is this is probably a cheap answer, but Twitter again. Um, I've been on Twitter for for a long time, and I'm a huge believer in kind of the 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 amazing power of real-time information from lots of people around the world. Um, I think when I'm not uh, when I'm not reading Ed Surge, I think I do get a lot of my news from both education and otherwise from from Twitter. Um, and it's also just a really uh, there's different ways there's different things you want to be educated on. You know, news is one, uh, education or ed tech is another, and um, it's nice to be educated about your friends too. We all have friends now all over the place and. <laughs> Twitter is a great way to to keep them up to date with you know what what it, uh, what they're doing, what their kids are doing now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a it's a great place to learn about a variety of things. Uh, my favorite tool is it's like choosing a family member. Some of them just drive me crazy, and some of them I love, but it's hard to pick just one. Um, at the risk of being, I'm trying to be impartial. Let's go with, I really like Periscope. That's been a favorite <laughs> tool of mine recently. We actually just Periscoped ourselves uh, podcasting a little while ago. The concept of having a live streaming app that's connected to Twitter. This is our that's, colleague, that's, Tyler. That's Tyler. That's Tyler. Hey guys. Okay. <laughs> Director of growth at EdSearch. <laughs> uh, the, the concept of being able to live stream anything from anywhere, anytime. I think the implications of that for the classroom are just tenfold. I'm also very curious to see how the privacy discussions develop around Periscope. I think it's going to become much more popular in the classroom, but how students are going to be involved in that um, and still have their sort of identities 
you know, not necessarily just put out there for the entire world mm -hmm. to see is going to be a mm -hmm. topic for discussion, I think, as it becomes more popular. Question number three. What is the best advice you've ever been given as a podcaster? As a podcaster, uh, Betsy gave me some really good advice um, really early on, which is uh, Betsy is our CEO. She was just making faces at us. Uh, <laughs> she said, she said start cheap. Uh, there we, oh, there's, there's, there's Tyler, Tyler again. once again. It's also, also president of the company. Uh, so Betsy, uh, Betsy and I were doing a recording together, and um, she is she has a lot of experience in telling stories, and she has camera and media training from her time as a journalist. And she was sharing how important it is to modulate the tone of your voice. Uh, I'm not that good at it yet, but when you listen to Betsy uh, on our podcast, she's very good at getting very quiet sometimes and draws you into the story, and then she gets louder, and you're excited to listen to her. Um, and so that's something that uh, she has tried to teach me a little bit how to do. It's something I'm still trying to get better at. Uh, but I think that's really good advice that I've now noticed. Oh, yeah, you know, uh, Ira Glass does that or, or Alex Bloomberg or the other people that I like to listen to. Yep. I would agree with that and also follow it up with a very short piece of advice, which is just keep going. You know, <laughs> a podcast that lasts for three months and then you stop uploading content consistently, they, of course, they don't end up getting as popular because people can't rely on it. Your listeners rely on you you know they they hope that there's going to be a consistency to to the scheduling by which you deliver good content and so i think as long as you just keep going consistently that's that's great number four what do you hope your listeners take away from your podcast i i've, I've been answering first a lot why don't you why don't you go i'm gonna say i hope that they take away anything that is meaningful to them and benefits them in the practices that they do um i don't think there's any one thing that i would hope that people take away from our podcast because we have so many different listeners who have different interests and motivations for coming to check it out um but as long as it affects them positively in a way that makes their practices and their um uh, the work that they do better that's the most important thing i think in my opinion. yeah I hope people take away information that helps them to make decisions, um, whether that's decisions about you know, what tool to use, about uh, different types of instructional practice to, to pursue. Um, we're just trying to, to give people, to help people understand more about what it is they're doing in, in the classroom or yeah. in the education space. Yeah. Did you notice how he just threw you under the bus with, with that question? Wait, I threw you under the bus? You, you're like, Wait, dude, you, you answer the question right? first. You threw me under the bus? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because I made you answer the question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We do, yeah we eh, do it's fine. Yeah. We have to, you know, hand off or Now I look like a jerk on Jeff's podcast. I was just thinking that is not a rookie podcaster move. That was actually pretty smart on that one. I could say something controversial that would make me sound like a, uh, a jerk. Well, well let's, let's make me look I smart. hate smart boards. I think whiteboards are the worst. I think interactive whiteboards are the worst. Oh. There you, go. you and I are on the same <laughs> page. Out, yeah, there you go. You you and I are absolutely on the same page for that one. Oh, good. Excellent. I Let's talk I as as a, as a music teacher, I actually fought my district 3 years in a row to not put a whiteboard on my board because I I needed music notes. I didn't need interactivity. I needed something that I can anyway. Number 5. <laughs> what is the and this is the hard one here. What is the best teachable moment each of you have ad, have ever had? Ever had in our lives? Uh, let's start with education. You can keep with podcasting. It's what is the best thing that you were like? Darn, that was re that was really cool. Teachable moment. Wow, that is a hard question. That is a really hard question. Hey, we um, don't, we don't we don't pull punches here in TeacherCast. No, oh. not at all. I'm just wondering. I'm, and now I'm I'm trying to decide if there's going to be an awkward silence now. Yeah, I think Michael if, and I. If you don't cut dead air either, this. we're going to be in trouble. Mike's like, can I get her to go first again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is the best teachable moment? I mean, I, you know, uh, okay, I'll go first because Michael answered the first three on his own, and uh, I, don't, I don't mind taking this one. Um, this is going to be a little bit of an off color occasion because of the fact that it is something that is so memorable to me but has it has taught me a lot about what teachers go through day in and day out so my first couple of years of teaching i was horrible at classroom management absolutely terrible like i've never i can't believe they still employed me i'm gonna be honest with you <laughs> but it did take me a while to figure it out and you know <laughs> i found a note in my classroom one day um that was left on the floor by one of my students and i guess you know it just kind of been tossed to the side. I'm sure they didn't mean for me to find it, but I did find it. And it said, 
there was a bad word in it. Miss Mata is, my last name is Mata. Miss Mata is a B star, 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 star. So fill in the gaps. But it said, Miss Mata is a bad word, dash, and I love her. And I think what was interesting about that was I realized that what that message told me was the realities of being a teacher are that you have to have really high standards for your kids. And sometimes it's going to, it's just, it's going to drive them crazy. But if you have high standards for them, they really love it. And I think in the world of ed tech, we need to hold the same standards for ourselves because it's easy to get distracted by what's most quote unquote innovative or what's most interesting or disruptive, blah, 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 buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. But if you, it, if you really, really think about it, a lot of those innovative products are complicated and difficult for students to use. And at the end of the day, probably don't have any real manifestation at, at the end of their, you know, schooling lives. So I think the most teachable moment in my life was when that happened because it made me realize that A, relationships with students are the most fundamental piece to giving them what they need. And, um, you know, the second one was really holding yourself to a high standard and holding your product and your coworkers and your students to a high standard is really the best way to be successful. Having high, high goals, even if you don't reach them, you're going to get damn close. And the higher you reach, you know, the higher potential you have. My, uh, Mike, you should have gone first. That was a pretty damn good one. <laughs> that was a really good story. Thank you. I still uh, have that note. I, I put it on yeah. my wall. I saved it because I wanted to remember it for the rest of my life. And people come into my room and they see it and they're very confused as to why I have it on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my story is, is co completely, could not be more different. Okay. <laughs> um, so my background is not in teaching. It's in, uh, I, I, after college, went into the consulting world. That's I consulted for about three years. Um, and very within like six or eight months of starting as a consultant, I'm still very much trying to figure out what the heck I'm doing. Um, we had this kind of strange project that was very different from anything I'd ever done. Um, and we had the sort of support structure wasn't, uh, normally there's sort of like a low level person, a mid level person and a high level person. And uh, in the middle of this project towards sort of towards the end, the middle person, her sister had a baby or something, or you know, she had to go take care of family obligations and she was gone for a while. And so it was just me and, and the, the sort of higher up person. Um, and uh, because I didn't have that kind of level of support, uh, and you know, this, these are, these, I made several, a series of mistakes that were, that were big deals. Um, and then I had to figure out how to deal with them. Um, and so, you know, the first thing I learned was you should always be honest about them. And, and I was honest about it. Um, but then, you know, the reaction of, of that higher up person was, um, I learned a lot from that. You know, she wasn't, um, she was not angry about it. She said, okay, well, let's like, A, let's, what's past is past and let's figure out how we can now move forward to deal with this. Um, and secondly, you know, she said, she, we, she took the time to sit with me and say, what, what, what could you have done better to avoid this mistake? And we worked on that and she said, okay, now let's figure out what I could have done better to avoid this mistake as well. Um, and so that was a really, it was a really important moment um, for me because A, it was my first like big screw up in the, in the adult world. Um, and also it you know, taught me a lot about how to, deal with people in, in the workplace and even, you know, within, within a family, we all have relationships, whether professionally or personally, where we are you know, managing or, or, or teaching or in charge, sort of in charge of, of somebody else in a way. Um, and, you know, the more you can deal with those people with, with patience and without ever like, blaming anybody or, or getting mad, I think is, is really the way to go. And I try to emulate that in, in the workplace too. You do a very good job. Oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah. You guys were good at that one. <laughs> Mary Jo and Michael, thank you guys so much for coming on. You know, please um, feel free to reach out and invite yourself back on next time. Uh, would love to have you guys come on. Would love to, you know, share more stories as we go through here. Uh, one last time, where do we learn more about EdSurge? Absolutely. Go to edsurge.com, mm -hmm. E-D-S-U-R-G-E.com. Um, once you're there, you can check out all of our news. You can sign up for our newsletters. You can check out our jobs board, uh, sign up for our concierge project, sign up to attend one of our summits. It's all at edsurge.com. Everything you need. Everything. Excellent. And for the podcast, we talk a lot about the podcast. Uh, you can find that on edsurge.com as well or on iTunes or Stitcher or SoundCloud or wherever it is you like to get podcasts. Mm -hmm. And tweet at us and, if you have yeah, any questions, please. feedback, just edsurge on Twitter. 
Well, my friends, that wraps up this episode of the TeacherCast podcast. Thank you so much for making TeacherCast your home for professional development. There's, of course, several great ways that you can reach out and be a part of the show yourself each and every week. We love it when you find us on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voicemail over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at TeacherCast.net and subscribe and comment over on our iTunes and YouTube channels at TeacherCast.net slash iTunes and TeacherCast.net slash YouTube. Hope everybody's having a great start to their school year. Until next time, keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students.